Well, a very good afternoon to you all. We're going to have a look at this subject of the Holy Spirit gifts and whether they are available and whether they work today. Some churches suggest that they do, some suggestions suggest that they don't. Who's right? Uh, and, 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 and so on. So we're going to get to the, the bottom of this uh, subject, uh, God willing. Now, we're going to have a look at one uh, to begin with, and that's the, the subject uh, or the, the gift of the speaking in tongues. I'm not going to go through all the gifts, but we're going to focus it on this one to begin with, and then we'll bring in uh, the other gifts uh, a, a little bit later. <clears throat> so, uh, this gift of uh, uh, speaking in tongues is otherwise known, we look it up in the dictionary, as the word glossolalia. And glossolalia is a phenomenon in which people speak in languages unknown to them. Okay, so they stand up and they start this, this babble, this speech that they, some say they understand, some say they don't. And it's this great big long speech and it's called glossolalia. Actually, glossolalia appears in the scriptures. It's in Acts chapter 2 verse 11 where we read, And Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak which is the Greek word lelio, in our tongues or in our languages, uh, which is the Greek word glossa, the wonderful works of God. And we'll come up to uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, a little bit late, later. <coughs> so, glossolalia. It's mainly used in religious uh, uh, purposes, but, but actually not exclusively. And some churches teach that it's the spirit of, uh, gift of God, which allows them to speak in what they term as God's language. Um, and, and what is God's language? What did the Bible say about God's language? And today, who uses it? Well, it's mainly the Pentecostals. And the Pentecostal movement was founded in 1905 by two men, Mr. Parham and Mr. Seymour. And Mr. Parham says that actually, if you are baptized, you automatically receive the Holy Spirit gifts, or, or the, the ability to speak in tongues that, that come, that follows uh, uh, a bapt uh, somebody who's been baptized. Well, one year after the, the Pentecostals were formed, uh, 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 quite a, a phenomenon happened in, uh, uh, in, no, in America, rather. It became known as the Azusa Street Revival. And uh, something quite quite uh, staggering happened, uh, where, whereby uh, actually um, you might uh, see the uh, the headline here: "Weird Babble of Tongues: A uh, New Sect of Fanatics is Breaking Loose." Wild scenes last night on Azusa Street. Gurgle a world wordless talk by a sister. So this was recorded in uh, the local. Uh, media in in Los Angeles, I think it is, um, and uh, and what we uh, the, the news article goes on to say <coughs> that miracles happened on, on this uh, street, and people were heard to speak in languages that nobody had ever uh, heard of before. And the gentleman who came in was uh, uh, not Mr. Parham; he was the other man, Mr. Mr. Seymour. And it was written about him that same year that this man is able to interpret and to speak 16 languages. Uh, I thought the language of God was, was one language. But anyway, this man said he can speak 16 different languages. He came into this house in Azusa Street and the record says the Lord gave him messages which none but himself could understand. Nobody else could do it. Nobody could interpret it. He identified and interpreted and wrote a number of the languages. So no, nobody had a clue what was being said. Nobody could understand it, but, but he was the, the speaker and he could. Um, when, uh, after this, the Pentecostals went to the mission field, went all over the world to, to preach uh, their gospel. And they encouraged the natives, the Africans and, and, and what have you, to speak in tongues so that the natives could then understand the truth. So the only way they understand the truth is by getting them to speak in tongues. Uh, there was one big problem. Some natives had not got a clue what these supposedly English American were, were saying. And so it, it was claimed 
uh, not to work. Of course, if you ask the Pentecostals, all of it worked. Anyway, who else uses glossolalia? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we'll come on to that in a moment, uh, and uh, their leaders and uh, others. And then uh, later on, it became in, uh, widespread into Mormonism, although in the late 30s and early 1940s, uh, Mormonism, uh, the Mormons stopped using it because they had a lot of bad press because they were forcing children to, to speak in uh, languages, uh, speak in tongues. This is a, a picture of the Kirkland Temple in Ohio, the very first temple to be built for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it was recorded that in 1836, this temple had a blessing. And at the time of blessing, there were people were speaking in tongues and others were able to interpret. And based on those interpretations, there were other men who stood up and were able to give exhortations based on those interpretations. Now, this is a man, his name is Mr. Samarin, he's an American, uh, but he, his lifetime, uh, or his, his work was based in the University of Toronto, and he was a world famous linguist. And in 1972, the year before I was born, you won't believe it, would you? But it's the year before I was born, and uh, he completed a worldwide study on glossolalia. He took 11 recordings, um, according to 11 different languages, 21 countries and six religions. And he wanted to analyze what glossolalia was all about. And this is what he, he said. Each recording showed syllables, consonants and vowels from the speaker's own native language. So in other words, he didn't find anything that was godlike, anything that unique anything that was a, a, a above a human language. And then he said that these syllables, consonants and vowels, he said, were all put together in what he described as a haphazard way. Or to you and I simple people, a load of mumbo jumbo. <laughs> and separate studies uh, since by uh, um, uh, uh, linguists have actually confirmed that this man's uh, Mr. Samarin was actually correct. And in his study in 1972, he gave a particular study on Pentecostal glossolalia. And this is what he writes. He said that what he heard was meaningless, but phonologically structured human utterance. Okay, so there's nothing godlike, nothing unique, nothing um, uh, 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 above human languages. It was all meaningless, but uh, 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 meaningless human utterance. And then he compared six other religions, so not just six sects of um, Christianity, six religions who used it. And this is what he wrote. There was no distinction between what was practiced by Pentecostal Protestants and the followers of other religions. Okay, so there, there was, if, if one of them said, no, no, it's a God language, then he says, either all, all were correct or all were wrong. And his opinion was that they were all wrong because it was just uh, uh, syllables uh, and consonants and vowels uh, mixed up. Just a little bit of history now, uh, speaking in tongue. This is uh, uh, Celsus, a second century Greek philosopher. He heard glossolalia. He described it as incomprehensible, incoherent, and utterly obscure utterances, the meaning of which no intelligent person could discover. And he said it was meaningless and nonsensical. Going a little bit forward in time, now the Camisards, uh, who were a group of French Protestants, and they apparently uh, spoke in tongues and each speaker had the gift of speaking in tongues and they were able to interpret what they said and then a little bit towards our time well uh, John might remember this no I'm just joking um, the, in the Catholic Apostolic Church a Scottish clergyman called Mr Irving he wrote that a woman was speaking in tongues and he said she spoke at great length and with superhuman strength in an unknown tongue to the great astonishment of all who heard and to her own great edification and enjoyment in God. 
So what do we conclude about all that? Actually, I'm going to change the title. We're going to call it Confusions rather than, than Conclusions because from what all the churches say about speaking in tongues, is it available today or not? And if it does, does it work? Is Mr. Samarin right? Or, or are the uh, Pentecostals digging their heels and saying, no, it is right? Is it a God-given lived? Is it God's language? Or is it is it human babble? What's the point of it? Of it? Is, is the woman that the uh, Mr. Irving saw... Uh, right? Is it for our own enjoyment or is it for the benefit of others? I mean, what, what, when do we use it? Do we have it after we're baptized? Is Mr. Parham correct? And who does the inter- Do we do the, uh, our own interpreting? Does somebody else do, do the interpreting? Um, feel free to come in, sir. We're just dealing with the uh, Holy Spirit gifts. And uh, who does who does the interpret? Do we do the interpreting? Does somebody else? And what about exhortations? Are they based on interpretations? Are they based on on the glossolalia? What, what what's the purpose of, of it all? So I, I think because we call this confusions, I think one thing, one lesson I'd, I'd really want you to take away this afternoon is, if we want the truth will always find it in the scriptures. With God, as we'll see, God is not the author of confusion. God gives us in his word, plainly written in our own language, and lots of other languages in the Bible, so whatever language we, we, we speak with is our native language, we may well find the Bible. God has recorded the message for us. These things and other things, the truth is in the scriptures. All we're gonna do is pick it up and read it. And, and if you're unsure, help some here at the Catholic Christadelphians, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to open their Bibles and, and uh, to uh, uh, explain these things from the, the Scriptures uh, to you. Now, if you open your Bibles to the, uh, the Gospel of Mark, we're going to have a look at the last chapter. Because we're going to open our Bibles now to find out what is the truth about these spirit gifts, these powers and whether they are alive today or not. What was the purpose? Is there any confusion? Mark chapter 16 was all about the the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work he's going to give to his disciples. And we read in Mark chapter 16, he says in verse 15, he says to the the, the 12, uh, to the 11, they were were then, he said unto them, go ye into all the world, which is all the, the Roman world then, and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, actually, a little bit of a problem there, because these were these were Jewish men. The only language they know was Hebrew, and all they were did in their jobs was like, fishermen. So Jesus said, "I want you to go throughout all the Roman world, where there are different languages, and I want you, as Hebrew men, old fishermen, I want you to preach the truth to them." How are they going to do that? How are they going to speak in, in Latin? How are they going to speak in, in, in Greek? If, if they only understood Hebrew, <clears throat> bear that in mind. He that believeth and is baptized. So people are going to have to listen. This isn't glossolalia. They're not, not going to give them a load of babble. They're not going to understand. The, the, the purpose of your communicating with them is that they might believe. They're, they're not going to stand there and listen to a load of babble and then find the truth that way. They're going to have to believe, and they're going to have to respond to that by being baptized. And that's how salvation will be given, verse 16. Verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils or demons, and they shall speak with new tongues or new languages. Ah, right, okay. And now we've got a clue. God, Jesus said, you'll, you'll be given a power that will allow you to speak in different languages, not a God language, not a load of babble that people don't understand. The purpose was that they, these old fishermen who understand Hebrew, could go into other countries of different languages and speak the truth. Remember, they've got to believe. Not, not, not got, got to believe that these were godly men because they speak babble, but they've got to understand the truth. And then, Verse 18, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So two things Jesus says that you're going to have in power in order to 
that, that my, men might believe. You'll have the power to speak in their languages so they can understand the truth. And you'll have the power to be able to prove that you are not just a bunch of old fishermen, that actually you are you are a servant of the, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll be given the power to prove that by miracles. Okay, but we'll come on to proof uh, a little later. So what happened in the, the work uh, of the apostles? Well, we go to a book aptly called The Acts of the Apostles. Return with me to chapter one. And in Acts chapter one, the disciples thought that the next day, Jesus had been a, 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 a raised from the dead. They thought the next day, that now that he was here in the land, he was gonna set up the kingdom. But he had to remind them that actually some work had, had to, got to take place first. And he was reminding them of what he told them in, 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 that's recorded in Mark chapter 16. So they asked the question um, at the end of verse six, is the, is the kingdom gonna be established now? And Jesus said, verse 70, well, it's not to you to know what that time, when that time will be. But remember, verse 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So he was reminded them. They've got their work to do. Remember, Jesus said, you're going to preach the truth. People are going to have to believe the truth, and they will do that through you. So, Acts chapter 1 then goes on that Jesus said, is, has descended into heaven. So the apostles are on their own now. Chapter 2, verse 1. What's the day of Pentecost? Now, as we see on the screen, the day of Pentecost, or, or the Feast of Weeks, we see from Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. It was a time when in three times a year, all the males were to appear before God in the place which God shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, this day of Pentecost, all the men were, so, uh, were in the city of uh, Jerusalem. And we noticed uh, from verse uh, 9 of chapter 2, there were Parthians there, there were Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia. They came from all over the place. In fact, we've got a map here on, on the screen. So all over the, the Roman world, these men, okay, these Jewish men, who had been scattered abroad many, many years previously, and who had been speaking in, in, in their own, who'd been... Uh, uh, lived over many years uh, without the Hebrew language and been speaking the languages in the countries from where they came. So they really couldn't really partake or, 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 or listen very well to the, to the services, if you like, in the day of Pentecost because they didn't understand the language. Now, what happened here? A power came upon the apostles. Remember, Jesus said that would happen in chapter 1. And then verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Remember, the tongues is, is, is the word languages. They were able to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is the scriptures telling us how this particular Holy Spirit gift worked. That the power of the Holy Spirit influenced them and allowed them to speak in a different language in a language that the Mesopotamians could understand and the Pontus and, and, and the Asians and the Pigeons and the, and the Cretans, they could understand the truth. So it wasn't the case of one stood up and, and spoke a little barbel and everybody was wondering what on earth was this man was saying? And yet another apostle then had to interpret. There was nothing like that. It, the, the, the simple reason, and again, no confusion here, Jesus said that they would have the power to speak in the languages of the other nations around the Roman Empire so that they might understand the truth. That's the important thing, that they might understand the truth. And then verse, uh, uh, verse 5, they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Okay, so these were Jewish men coming to the feast of <coughs> Pentecost. And then verse 15, for the, uh, verse 14 for connection. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay, so others who are listening to this 
uh, uh, these disciples speaking in other languages, well, it would be a bit of a babble, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, if somebody was to stand here and talk to me in Russian, I wouldn't have a clue what he was saying. It would be like a, a, a babble. So, you know, people were, were, were knocking this, this, this phenomenon saying, oh, well, they, these men, they've got to be drunk. And Peter was standing, no, 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 they're speaking the truth with the power of the Holy Spirit to those Jewish men who could understand what they were saying. So it was not a babble. And Peter just confirmed that to, to, for us. Actually, he said it, it, this is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy from uh, in verse 16 from what the prophet Joel said who said verse 17 it shall come to pass in the last days that's the last days of Judah's commonwealth uh, 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 saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams now, the interesting thing here is that the word prophesy in these verses, um, well, you all know what prophesy means. It means to, to foretell the future, and you would be correct. But it also means to speak under inspiration. Again, an, a word I need you to, to remember. They were able to speak under inspiration and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach the truth to all the countries in which they were uh, scattered. Because how, how on earth were the people of the world going to understand the truth unless they had it in their own uh, language? So, no confusions here. This is what we conclude from what the Bible says about speaking in tongue. That the disciples themselves were given the gifts and this enabled them to perform miracles. Remember from John chapter 12 verse 11? This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and his disciples believed on him. So this, these miracles weren't given to say, oh, this is how clever I am and this is how good I am, what a talent I have. It all for the purpose that people might believe. The, the speaking in tongues was that people might believe in the word of God. And another conclusion um, was that the power enabled them to speak in the foreign language, not a babble, not incoherent uh, 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 language, but in foreign languages, so that people might hear as a fulfillment of what Joel said about uh, the last days. <clears throat> because it was always in the purpose of God, and that's a theme that run, runs right through scripture, and uh, uh, a lot of it we can read of in the, in the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah very beautifully, the calling of the Gentiles. And we read it in the Old Testament and the New Testament that the purpose of the God was that the Gentiles would come to hear the word of the gospel. How can they hear the word? How can we understand the gospel if, if it was only given in Hebrew? Acts chapter 28 again says to have that the Gentiles were to hear the truth. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, likewise, and also in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 60 verse 3 and chapter 66 verse 19 it's always in the purpose of god that the gentiles would hear the truth and have the ability to uh, respond now i'd like to turn with me to the first epistle of paul recorded epistle to paul uh, to the corinthians and chapter 12. now here was uh, Cor corinth I was an ecclesia of the first century and they'd been given the holy spirit gifts to work in the ecclesia and we noticed that when we look at these gifts and why they were used none of it was for their own enjoyment like the woman that the uh, mr irving the, uh, in 18 something or other uh, said that the, the woman had been speaking in tongues for her own edification and her own enjoyment that contradict that uh, that's contrary to what the scriptures say was the purpose of the Holy Spirit gifts. And in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, um, the apostle writes, the beginning of verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I know that you were Gentiles carried away with, unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. And then he goes on to talk about the spirit gifts and how they've actually been misused by the, the, the believers in Corinth in uh, the first century and but he goes on to say verse four now these 
that there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. So in other words, the Holy Spirit, there is no such thing as a Holy Spirit gift as, as an entirety. There are various gifts for various purposes. Uh, the, the same truth, the, the, the same focus, the same point of it all, the same workings, but different gifts. Verse uh, 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So in other words, they weren't for their own enjoyment. One can't stand them and say, oh, can I have the gift of healing? Oh, I, I'd love to do that. I'd like to go to my neighbours and, and do it all. It wasn't for their own enjoyment. It was for the prophet, the meeting, the, the, the congregation, the, the group of believers or, or, or the ecclesia, uh, as we like to say. The manifestation of the spirit, the purpose of the spirit was to profit the ecclesias. Verse 8, for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by, by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues or languages, to another the interpretation of languages. But all these worketh that one and the same self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So that's how the, the, the gifts were, were divided in the ecclesia, that they all might use it to the benefit of others, to the benefit of those around. So for instance, in Corinth was a, a university city, and there might be people who didn't understand the uh, a, a Greek or even Hebrew. So there were those who were able to, to speak in the language uh, to which those who were listening could understand, and more importantly, come to a knowledge of the truth. And here is a, a, a list, uh, and we'll go through these uh, a little bit later. Um, I grouped them into threes. Uh, I think I'm right in saying this, but the, the wisdom, knowledge, and, and, and faith, I, I sort of subcategorize those as things, uh, the workings on the mind, okay? We, we think about that faith, and, and, and the knowledge goes in the mind, and the wisdom. Well, the, the, these gifts are obviously influenced, the, the, the thinking of the, those who had these gifts. The, the ones in yellow were what they say, prophesy, no, I think I spent that on right? No, no, oh yes, I, no, I spent it right. Um, uh, speaking in tongues and, and interpreting of tongues. And I guess that the green, the ones are the doings. Okay, but we'll, we'll come to that uh, in, in a moment. Because if, if we don't have any of these gifts, but the first century did, uh, are we at a disadvantage? Well, we'll come on to that in a, a moment. Now, let's have a look at chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. And we see, again, a, a similar verse to what we see also in chapter 12. But, uh, uh, chapter 14, verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, they all wanted to use it, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church, or edifying of the ecclesia, the congregation. That was the purpose, that they might be edified. What does edification mean? To edify simply means to, to build up. In a literal sense, it means to be a house builder. Okay, so what the Apostle Paul was saying is that the Spirit gives there were to build up the ecclesia, okay, to, to strengthen them so that, you know, if they were lacking in faith, the one who had the Spirit gifts of faith is able to, 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 to work that, to, to give them that faith and to show them that uh, work. And then in chapter 14 was the... the uh, uh, the, the ecclesia here at Corinth, we're, we're misusing them. But just have a look at, the, go back a few verses to verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now, I don't know whether you've noticed in your Bible that the word unknown is in italics. It means it's not there in the original. Okay, so the, the King James Version, uh, uh, people who put the, the, uh, the translation together, put that, slip that in. Okay, because they, 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 they thought that that was the correct meaning. There was an unknown tongue or an unknown language. These weren't unknown languages. They weren't speaking in Babel. It says, for he that speaketh in a, in a language. 
Okay, he's talking about the gift of the speaking in tongues. He that speaketh in a language speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So what, what the Apostle Paul was saying is, you're misusing the gifts. If there are Greeks in the audience, use the spirit gifts of speaking in tongues and use the, the Greek language so that they can understand it. But if you're using Latin or, or another language, how are they going to understand? God can understand it because he knows all languages. But they aren't, and that purpose is to build up the ecclesia. The purpose is to, that they might be believers. How can they understand you're speaking in a different language? And this is the sort of sim a scenario I I'm talking about. You get a speaker on the platform, and he speak comes up in a nice suit, and he, he speaks one language, and his audience are, are going, well, you know, how, how am I being edified? How can I understand what this man is saying? I'm wasting my time sitting here because I'm not getting any edification. I, I'm not getting any understanding of what the truth is all about. And I'm not getting any uh, 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 help as to in the way in which I should change my life in accordance with the truth. I'm not getting any benefit at all. And that's why the Apostle Paul is saying, use them correctly. Use them not to your own enjoyment, but to the benefit of others. Verse 3, he that prophesieth, this is using the, the, the gift of prophecy, he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. How are we going to get that in this, uh, this scenario? How are the audience being comforted in the things of the truth? They can't understand what's being said. So that's the purpose of, here of the spirit uh, gifts. And then verse 6 of this chapter. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking in languages, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you by the by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Doctrine is going to help you. Prophesying, talking about the future uh, events of the kingdom of God, that's going to help you by giving you the knowledge of how to live and how to be, behave and how to believe, that's going to help you. But if I speak in all sorts of languages that you don't understand, that's not going to help you one bit. Now, I'm just going to, a, bit, a little bit of a sidestep. And we see more of this in the, in the epistle to the Ephesians. The tabernacle in the Old Testament. Now, the tabernacle was a meeting place for God that the, the, the Jews in the wilderness uh, set up by God's command and they were issued with the, uh, this. And this was a, not just a, a place where the, the, the Jews could meet outside and bring their offerings, but it was also a teaching guide. You know, two men, Bezalel and Aholiab, who built the tabernacle and they taught Israel, not just why, what feasts to bring and what the purpose and what the meaning of, of it was. They, they taught them from this piece of furniture here all about what the truth's all about. And what we see the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians, he's saying that the, 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 the tabernacle was very much like the ecclesia today, a meeting place for God. What's that all that about? For instance, the materials of the tabernacle came from the Egypt, from the world, and the ecclesial, the Gentiles were from the world. Okay? Next one, it would be a place where God would dwell, and God dwells amongst his people in the ecclesia. And then, specifically, God said to the people that the, the, the tabernacle was to be holy, and, of course, the ecclesia, which isn't the building, this, this sort of type, the, 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 the building, that the people were to be holy as God is holy. That was the command given to them. All materials had a role to play, just like there's different roles in the Ecclesia. So you see, all, all these are, are very similar um, uh, to uh, the Ecclesia. The tabernacle talk to them about Christ, just as the Ecclesia is to keep the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Israel were to meet there in the tabernacle, just as the Ecclesia is commanded to meet together in order to, to worship God. And God's command came from the tabernacle, and the Ecclesia are to follow the uh, commands of God. Now, the interesting thing about the construction of the tabernacle is that the apostle uses 
that the terms uh, in, 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 in uh, how the ecclesia is like a building, like a tabernacle, in order to dwell, that God may dwell among them. We've already considered these two men, Bezalel and Holiab. And how did they know what God wanted them to make? God gave them power. See, Exodus 31, verse 2, I have called by name Bezalel, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. I have given with him Aholiab, the second man, in whom I have put wisdom. So God gave these two men the power to build what he had commanded, to, to bring forth his commandments. Okay? And what does God want of the Ecclesia? To follow his commandments, to keep his commandments. How are they going to do that if the spirit gifts aren't alive today? Interesting. We'll come on to that in a moment. And then... Uh, in Exodus 31, verse 3, the, the gifts that they were given were the gift of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship that they might can do this role. And of the ecclesia, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 1, that God may give unto you, oh look, there's the same things, look. That God may give unto the first century, not a building, but the people, gifts of wisdom, oh look, the same understanding and knowledge. Ah, there's one, one word missing out. And that actually comes in the next chapter. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto God and unto good works. So what do we see here? That Bezalel and Aholia were given the spirit gifts that they might build up the tabernacle. And Paul says that the, the first century believers were also given the same gifts that they might build up the Ecclesia. Now the point is that when Bezalel and Aholiab had finished the tabernacle, that's when it gets ceased. Once it's built, you don't need the gifts anymore. But what about us? We were not in the first century Ecclesia. And if the gifts ceased after the first century Ecclesia, what happens to us? Are we at the disadvantage? And this word workmanship, by the way, means the Greek word poema, which I think is where we get the word polymer from. It means a product or a fabric. That's interesting. What's the tabernacle made of? Products and fabrics. So, we've seen this already, how the spirit gifts ceased once Bezalel and Aholiab had completed the work. So, if these are the nine Holy Spirit gifts, and we don't have any of these today, uh, are we at a disadvantage? Uh, is that unfair on us? Well, actually, if we look at the scriptures, we see that the gift of wisdom is given to us in God's word. Let that in 1 Corinthians 12. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of God. Are we given the word of God? Well, yes, we are. It's in the scriptures. So, in other words, this contains the wisdom of God. All we've got to do is read it. Instead of being influenced directly by a power, we are given a power, which is the scriptures. Romans chapter 1, the power of the gospel of Christ. What about knowledge? Where do we get, oops, where do we get knowledge from? Again, the scriptures. They're another, the, the word of knowledge, the word of knowledge. We have it in God's word. How do we gain faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul says, faith comes by hearing. Yes, what, by a gift or some power? No, by hearing the word of God. See, the, the same link between all three. Let's have a look at the others. We'll have a look at this in a moment. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. The inspiration, remember that's what, what the word prophesy means, inspiration is given by the scriptures. What about the speaking in tongues? We do hear them speak in our tongues, our language is the wonderful works of God. Where do we get the wonderful works of God from? From the scriptures. The Bible is written in many languages. We'll go on to that in a moment. How do we interpret the, 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 the languages? How do we do the act of interpreting? The Bible does it for us. The Bible speaks for itself. And when Old Testaments prophesy, and it's recorded in the New Testament, they explain these prophecies. So we can come to interpret the scriptures by reading the scriptures. 
the discerning of gifts. John chapter 17, verse 7. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. What do we have that is of God? It's the scriptures. Healing. But Psalm 107. He sent his word and healed them. So, I mean, we don't throw a, a, a Bible at somebody and suddenly they're... They don't need their glasses anymore, or they can throw their walking stick away. It doesn't mean that. But the, the healing is in the scriptures because we can be healed of the nature, the very sin nature, which we bear. And that's the salvation that, that Jesus was talking about in Mark chapter 16. That salvation will be given to those who believe these things and who respond to that. What about miracles? The gospel of Christ. What's the gospel of Christ? It's in the scriptures. For it is the power of God unto salvation. How can a book of 66 books be so powerful to bring about salvation? That's a miracle in itself. Miracles are there for us in the scriptures. So we are not at a disadvantage. We are actually at an advantage because we have the gifts available today, but not in direct form, but from the scriptures. And so we see that the Bible is translated in many different languages. In fact, there's, the book, there's no book in the world that is translated in more languages than the Bible. So we can read it and come to an understanding uh, of what is being said. Now, by way of conclusion, if you turn with me to our reading from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy are words of encouragement for us as well. Timothy 3 verse well Timothy 3 is all about a chapter is all about those who have forsaken the truth they, they've gone away into error they haven't kept the truth they haven't looked at the scriptures they've been listening to others and they've been led astray and the apostle Paul is sorry about that he, he's, he's upset about that and he's saying to this young man Timothy don't you go in that way Otherwise, you won't find the truth. You'll, 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 you'll end up forsaking the truth. Remember, salvation is given to those who believe it and who respond. If these people don't believe it, then the, the hope isn't for them. Verse 14, But you, Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So the, the one thing that Timothy can do is continue with what he's been doing, continuing his learning. Where does he get his learning from? Verse 15, that from a child thou hast known the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we have the, in that verse, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the faith. Those three gifts, all in that one verse. And they're from the Scriptures. And he describes them as the Holy Scriptures. Remember, the Holy Spirit gifts. And he now describes that the scriptures that the book of, of, of God has recorded as the Holy Scriptures. If you continue in that, Timothy, that's all you need. Because at the end of the, of the chapter, verse 17, the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished. Remember, the tabernacle was furnished unto all good works. So that, that's, that's for us, isn't it? We can be complete. We're not at a disadvantage because we don't have the gifts. We have the gifts in written form in the scripture. We need to read it and uh, uh, learn from it and be encouraged thereby. And that will help us to be complete. That's all the, the tools that we need. But we missed the verse out, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Again, another gift, the gift of inspiration, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Remember? The first century believers, they needed the, the, the gifts to be profitable in the Ecclesia because they didn't have a Bible then, but only the Old Testament. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, in other words, for, for, for teachings, the, the correct teachings, all found in scripture, for reproof or, or proof. Remember the disciples were given the gifts of, of, of healing and of miracles. But all the proof we need... We don't need somebody to come and, and, and heal the sick in, in our midst. All the proof we need is in the scriptures. For correction, 
Okay, so we might say, oh, well, we know the truth, and let's ignore our Bible, and it's it's X, Y, Z, that is the truth. Actually, that's why we need the scriptures, to check, recheck, and re-recheck that what is to be believed is what we believe in. And we've got to allow the scriptures to correct us, so that if we if we think something is right, and the scriptures say, well, actually, it's a different thing, we've got to believe the scriptures. That's what he's there to correct us. For instruction in righteousness. What is righteousness? God's right ways. We don't know what the ways of God are are, unless we read the scriptures. It's all there contained for us. And so here comes the last lesson. And it's uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. The religions around us you know, have misused the scriptures. Let, let's face it, they have, haven't they? A very simple teaching, like the uh, speaking in tongues, was there for a purpose, that the disciples might speak in the, the, the language of those who listened to them. Not about showing off in a babble. Nothing to do with that. Very simple thing. And so therefore, when we come to the scriptures, we know that God will give us the understanding, because it's there in the scripture if only we use it so in the time that remains my dear friends i and because the dolphins here at cafe encourage you to use these tools so that we can be wise unto salvation and in that day we pray that that gift of salvation that that jesus said will be given to all those who believe and are baptized will be given to all of us when he returns Stop sharing.